Uh, Dr. Baca, we'll just say Elizabeth. We're pretty informal around here. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll have a, a, a presentation, which I think you'll find interesting, that uh, allows her to talk through some of the issues that she's learned in her own practice. Um, she doesn't call herself a public health practitioner. She's kind of backed into public health through looking at the way the built environment does enable health to flourish or not in a community, but has also been a practitioner looking at the actual physical outcomes of choices we've made as communities about where to put people and how to build those environments. So that's quite a unique uh, experiential set. So she's gonna speak, and then what we're gonna do after that is we're gonna invite uh, two members of the community uh, to come and give just a brief response to what they're hearing. And the two are Sheila Allen, a doctor, also Dr. Sheila Allen, uh, who's uh, the executive director of the YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance and a former school board member. Um, and as some of you may know, uh, Sheila uh, is a nurse as well and, um, and has a PhD in nursing. So she'll be giving a feedback as someone who lives in the community. Sheila is also a member of our Human Relations Commission. And I think you'll hear from Elizabeth at, at least some of the issues we're dealing with are, are human equity issues um, and how underserved populations do or do not have access to resources. The second respondent will be Peter Jacobson. Uh, Peter is an engineer, um, but he's actually a really nice guy too um, and very personal. No, what, what I, uh, Peter is also a member of, of Bike Davis. He's on the uh, board, I should say, of Bike Davis. And um, if you know of Peter's work and where I actually got to know Peter first was his, his uh, research and writing on safety in numbers. So how uh, safety for pedestrians and cyclists in particular uh, is improved the more people that are actually doing it. So numbers increase, safety increases. Uh, and I'm sure he can uh, share with you his key paper on that. So the, Presentation, some responses, and then we're gonna open it up for questions for any of the three. And um, we really will try to do it as questions, so asking them based on their expertise and experience. And uh, I'll be moderating that part, part to make sure we actually get to some questions, and um, we'll hear their responses. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Elizabeth, Great. and you can walk around with a mic. Okay, perfect. Do you need extra hands? Um, or? I, <laughs> I, will just, I just wanted to, while you were speaking, I actually pulled up um, a tweet from someone yesterday that I was going to do a quick quiz on. So thank you so much, Rob, for having me. And I think just for the leadership here in Davis, I think one of the things is we hear a lot of, there's a lot of not great news nationally right now, um, where this is being recorded, right? <laughs> Okay, I won't say too much, but um, but no, seriously, I think that what gives me hope is when you know these are these are exactly the kinds of meetings and things that we need to have happening, where we're having people come together and thinking about the civic engagement and community piece, where we're where this is designing the community. So it's great to be here tonight. Um, before I get started, I wanted to ask. So Eric Topol, who is a really um, amazing thinker in the space of health, he does a lot in health innovation digital health, thinking about healthcare. He just tweeted yesterday, and this is these are numbers that I've used a lot, but this actually just came out, it was in The Economist. So if I, so basically we spend 18% um, of our budget on a GDP on healthcare in this country. Um, so over 3.3 trillion a year, and there were 50 countries that were just ranked um, in, in terms of life expectancy. So I think one of the things on social equity when we talk about health is there, our environment has an impact, but it, this is, it impacts everybody, right? So um, cumulatively, our life expectancy, just curious, since we're spending so much, pretty much the most of any place, how, how many people think we were like in the top one to 10 countries in terms of ranking, raise your hand. So not one to 10, what about 10 to 20? Okay, so like a couple, 20 to 30, okay. Uh, 30 to 40, all right. Um, 40 to 50, you guys are right. So we ranked 48th out of 50. 
Now, again, the you know the, the in terms of life expectancy, they're they're minor different. You know, it's like a couple years. But but really, when you think about how much we're spending, um, and and that you we're getting you know not a lot in turn in return. Um, there's just a lot of questions as to what what are some of the underlying factors. And I think when I when I spent my time in clinical practice, this was something that very much um, came out um, in terms of what is impacting our health. So one of the things um, or a couple of things I would love to talk about tonight is how this is really an idea whose time has come, right? I know that we have leaders like Judy who've been doing this for a long time, and I think it's been amazing. It's really started to set the framework for how we think about our communities and how we think about health. I think right now it's a really um, very exciting time because so many things are starting to come together, particularly here in California. Um, so I'll talk about that. I'll talk about our process in terms of the update we did for the general plan guidelines, because it's going to be very um, topical with some of the community projects you're doing in terms of the design charrette, um, and then think about some of the things in terms of innovation and what's next. So I think the first one, especially as we think about, as I mentioned, this new report that came out, right, or this most most recent on, on life expectancy, there are lots of reports like that that have come out. And I'm sure the folks that raise their hands for the 40 to 50 have seen some of those other reports. Um, but I think it's really a time to think about um, redefining health. So one is um, a lot of times, especially, you know, when I used to work with residents, it was really fun because I used to teach. And so we would always kind of, one of the first things was to sit down and say, you know, what's health? And, uh, you know, if I asked in here, um, actually, maybe I'll ask a couple people. So I'm just going to, does anyone want to volunteer what they would define health as? It's a friendly group. I'm looking over here. I'm looking over here. Here. Well, I mean, there are obviously a lot of factions to it, but I think the ability to do what you want with your life and be able to function well in a society and move along and, and be able to have mobility and, and feel comfortable with whatever you're doing. Great, great. Uh, let's see, we'll choose someone over here. How about here? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Um, I think it comes to uh, your self-defined quality of life and I think that um, being able to engage with your community is um, an important factor. So whether that uh, a piece of your mobility or your ability to, um, um, to get around is important. Yeah. So, and, and these are great. And so this is one of the things that I would, when we, when I was talking with residents, um, pediatric residents, meaning they were in training, not residents in the community. Well, they were also residents in the community. But I think this is one of the things, a lot of times when we think about health, there's obviously there's more holistic perspective, right? Community well-being, mobility, it's all of these other things that impact your quality of life on a day-to-day -day level. It's not merely the absence of disease or disease, right? Or access to healthcare. And I think that's kind of the, the change that we're starting to see. Um, as we think about health. And um, as Rob mentioned, so I used to spend um, time, I was at a federally qualified health center, so I specifically worked with um, a lot of population that was um, fairly underserved. And when I went into pediatrics, the whole other story, I was actually, I went to medical school because I was going to do neurosurgery. Um, but I ended up at the farthest area from that doing pediatrics. But um, but I think one of the things that was really um, clear in pediatrics, I was really interested in doing prevention because I spent time in adult medicine. I thought, oh, you know, by that point, you've, have, you've got habits and you have all these things. It's a little bit harder to make change. And what I realized pretty quickly working with the, the pediatric population is that I was already seeing a lot of kids who were suffering from adult diseases. They had depression, they had diabetes, they had asthma, they had all of these things. And it was setting them up for life, right? As a child, these things that you typically think about as pro problems within adulthood, the pathway for them was already being established really young. Um, and so, and they were not, they were not healthy. Um, and as we, we were doing more and more work, um, you know, we would work with the city and county working on, you know, access to play, safe places to play and trying to improve the environmental conditions. We did a lot of programs and letters and community training. And I think one of the key things when, when there's a criticism of the health system or you think, well, but, you know, it, it seems like it's failing, I think it's really important to realize that there are really amazing providers who are very dedicated and they're trying to do this work and amazing administrators. But I think part of the challenge is that the concept around what we, what we define as health and what impacts our health 
really is way beyond just healthcare. It's right. It's all of these other social, economic, environmental factors that impact our health, right? Um, and so one of the things is that we've seen uh, this has been happening over the last several decades, really, this integrated concept of health. Um, and I think one of the big pieces, and that's why it's really exciting to have an engineer on the response panel and um, nurse who's also, you know, you've been on the school board, is having that diverse perspective because we can't necessarily get to the place where we need to go without the partnership. It's really, we have to bring these different perspectives in to get to the changes that we, we need to see. Um, and that requires uh, cross-sector collaboration. So another piece, again, just kind of setting the national context, this was um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's a um, big funder in a lot of this work, and they've, they've actually imagined probably a number of you have heard about the culture of health. Um, this is a big campaign they've been trying to undertake to say, how do we start to support health, right, more holistically? What are the changes that need to happen, and how do they do that? They commissioned this study with the National Academy of Sciences. So National Academy of Sciences really puts together kind of the leading edge of all of the, the different research that's out there. And they asked us to look at these health disparities. So one of the things is even though we see um, the, the differences in life expectancy, right? Um, there are many countries uh, or many places in the country where the life expectancy is um, worse than many developing countries, like significantly worse. Like there can be a 10 year to 15 year gap in a couple mile um, distance. And so that was why they commissioned this report. And again, I think one of the key things is it's not just about that spectrum, what we realize when we look at the data is everybody's on that spectrum. So we're still having, you know, worse health outcomes compared to a lot of other places. In, a sen in essence, they, they wanted to look at community-based solutions. Um, it was a really diverse committee. So again, kind of that diversity of perspective. We had economists, we had um, a sister, we had somebody from one of the reservations, um, we had hospital system CEOs, really a great group coming together to look at the research and put forward um, recommendations. And again, this was kind of one of the key things, again, they're in, um, called the social determinants or the social, economic, and environmental um, factors that impact our health. But this was just saying, again, this, this recognition that it's about all of these different pieces together. So transportation, um, public safety, physical environment, housing, uh, which I know you guys have talked about, education, employment, it's really all of those factors coming together to, to support our best health. So in, in, in terms of the recommendations, if anyone's more you know, interested, I can um, give you some of the report highlights and links to the report. But I think even within this work, it was really like getting this national group together to say, what, where do we go? Where, how do we start to change all of this in terms of recommendations? Um, so I think in terms of healthy planning, this is really a big turning point, as I mentioned. So there are really a confluence of factors that have been um, happening, I think, across. Now, it's changed a little bit with some of the changes at the federal level, but I still think here in California, we're doing so much innovative work that it keeps me really optimistic that we're going to see a change. But I wanted to talk about four key areas why I think this is the time um, that this is changing. There's some policy opportunities. Um, there are actually economic drivers. In fact, the fact that in the, econo uh, the Economist, they're talking about life expectancy now, right? That's definitely a sea change. Um, and then the, the opportunity around innovation planning designs and some funding incentives. So here within California, this is, um, this is a, a um, used to have a slide with the national stuff, but <laughs> right now it's more focused because we're, we're in the lead. Um, but I think that there are a number of things that have come out recently. So um, one is we have the sustainable community strategy. And what's really interesting when you start to look, especially um, as Rob mentioned, I'm working a lot on the Global Climate Action Summit. A lot of the policies that are really important to help us advance our climate goals end up being the same goals to help us advance community planning, um, which we'll get into in, some, in terms of some of the policies around walkability, bikeability, transit-oriented development. All of those things really start to align. Same with complete streets. So we actually have um, complete streets legislation now here in California. Not every state has this, right? So we have the policy framework to start to help support doing this work. Um, AB 32 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, air quality, environmental justice. So there's a lot of legislation and policy framework that we have um, to support this. The other thing I would say is there have been a lot of initiatives um, at the California level. Again, so we have um, the governor had uh, the Let's Get Healthy California Task Force. Has anyone heard of that task force? 
some of the work? Couple people, okay. So that's a great report. Again, look, kind of looking at those social, economic, and environmental factors. But again, it's great because it creates this dialogue. It creates this conversation to start to move things in that direction. Um, we have a wellness plan. Um, there have been so many local governments across the state that have been really integrating this work, and a lot because of the local government commission really, you know, helping to to support um, uh, local environments doing this. And then, um, as I mentioned, the the co benefits piece. So there's a ton of opportunity from a policy perspective. Um, this is actually on the economic driver's side. So in traditional healthcare, um, you know, I mean, when I was still in, in clinical practice and I spent, you know, a long time before that, when we would start to talk about some of these initiatives or trying to do more prevention, it was so far off the radar because it wasn't part of, you know, it wasn't part of the traditional conversation. But as the percent of GDP has grown, um, as I mentioned, we're at 18% right now, around 18%, um, what we've seen is that hospital systems, insurers, others have started to take note of this um, and start to get interested in thinking about um, health and what are the other um, pieces. This is also, this is actually, just to let you know, this publication, this graph actually comes from the Urban Land Institute, which is um, the professional organization for urban developers, right? So urban developers are starting to look at the economics of healthcare. It's interesting, right? <laughs> I see some, some interesting looks. And again, just to mention, I think this is um, really important that health outcomes vary across income levels and also by racial and ethnic groups. When I worked with the students, we would actually map out, we would have them use data from Santa Clara County and San Mateo County. And pretty much for most diseases, you'll see this kind of um, stepwise uh, relationship when you look at race and um, an income bracket for um, health outcomes. So we have the policy context that's really helping to support a lot of this work, right? So it's not as much of an uphill battle. We have um, some of the economic drivers that have started to align to do this work. And then we actually have a lot of innovation and planning. So again, a lot of the professional organizations that help create these places also are recognizing the links with health. So um, just to mention a couple, I was actually just um, two weeks ago giving a talk at the American Institute of Architects. So this is all, all of the architects thinking about how building design, how the lighting, how the air infiltration, um, are there stairs that are accessible so we can get our steps in and not have to take the elevator. All of these pieces are things that they're starting to think about. Um, as well as I mentioned the Urban Land Institute, um, the US Green Building Council, and then I would say another really big supporter has been the American Planning Association. So they have a whole research firm that's looking at health in the built environment, including food systems, walkability, aging in place, like a whole number of issues that um, they have a ton of resources on their, their website. So um, thinking about, so you've got all these things lined up. Now, one of the things um, is that, again, it kind of gets into this discussion around public health. So you know, from the individual to the, to the, to the system, um, we're seeing this new mix between the two. And I would say actually technology. So I also work on the governor's initiative in precision medicine, which looks at how we use all of this data. There's this interesting kind of um, convergence of technology and data and this not you know defined we used to think about public health in one space and then clinical medicine in the other and they're starting to come together and we see things like this is um from forbes um so Bo Do boston doctors now prescribe bike share programs to members crazy right that you can say we're going to give you a prescription and instead of you know giving you a prescription for this medicine which obviously that's really important as well but we're also giving you a prescription to have access to a bike share program um, the other uh, example, again, kind of thinking from the individual into the data, Cincinnati, I know these folks, they're, they're doing great. So when, um, great work, they actually would use public data and they could see where the asthma is getting exacerbated. They could hotspot it and then try to go in and fix things before they happened, right? So if it was poor um, housing quality or other issues. And then the other is also prescribing parks for better health. Right, so just having park space um, is really important in terms of getting out in your mental health. So just even prescriptions, again, very different paradigm for prescriptions and health. This is the other side. So instead of thinking about the individual, this is kind of on the community side, right? And again, we're seeing this convergence. So these are some um, different, um, it's not as dramatic, but I like the slide with the fire. Hopefully you don't see that um, on your way to work every day. Um, 
but you know, it's, you know, how do our bodies, how to reset our minds and bodies. So there's a lot of research out there on exposure to urban greening and to natural spaces and the impact that that has on your mental health and well-being. Um, also just being in your car, we, we, there are tons of studies, scientific studies that show like the more time you spend in your car, the higher the risk for other things, um, such as obesity, um, and then, uh, you know, just in general, designing communities, which we're talking about today, to make residents fitter and healthier, right, throughout the life spectrum. So I think we're definitely seeing that change. Uh, and then the last, I would say, that's really kind of um, moving, moving in this direction is the funding incentives. So we, um, again, I mentioned the um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation building a culture of health. Um, the California Endowment, that's down there making health happen by building healthy communities. Um, the Center for Disease Control. And then the Federal Reserve Bank, right? I know. The Federal Reserve Bank is actually doing a lot to fund healthy communities. What they recognized is a lot of the places where they're putting investments, um, particularly, in, especially in low-income areas, are the same places that people are trying to invest in health. So they actually started an initiative where they're bringing together health systems and financing to look at the overlap with that. Um, not only that, and so I remember a couple years back, I kept saying, when are you guys gonna start doing climate? When are you? And there was like, no, we're not gonna do climate, we're not gonna do climate. They now have a program called SPARK, which is specifically on resilience and, and looking at the co-benefits and climate as one of the issues. And this is the Federal Reserve Bank, right? So this is a lot of significant money and funding and how it happens. And, and so I think that's really um, exciting. So with all of that context and all of that background that's been happening um, over a, a significant period of time, um, there are, you know, within California, we had the opportunity to update the general plan guidelines. Um, this is really, as you know, the general plan is really that constitution for development. What's your vision for 20 to 30 years out? And what are all the different pieces that need to be included in that to make that realize? How do you, you know, take that vision and, and start to put in the plans, the policies and things in place to actually build those out? And what we saw was a lot of places, a lot of um, cities and counties across the state had started to do just that. This is, it's a little bit outdated because this is from, I think, 2011. Um, but this is a map, actually, of comprehensive plans, which is where California so we always like to do things different. We call it general plan. It's the same thing. Um, but this was a map. So the um, red area meant that it was accepted. The light red area meant that it was in draft form. This was actually put together by the American Planning Association by their research arm. And it shows you can see a number of places in California that have already adopted these types of policies to be health promoting into their general plan or into their comprehensive plan. Um, so when we took, undertook our update, there are the required things um, that have to be in the plan. And then there were things like climate change, health, economics, and equity that we wove throughout the entire update. So as we went across, as we had all of the discussions, those were themes that were very important. Um, I think some of the challenge we recognize that if a general plan, you guys have a really unique opportunity because you're going to be doing an update. So not every city and county is doing an update at the same time. But when, when it does happen, it's a really great opportunity to start to integrate these policies. So um, we, we officially announced in 2017, or published it in 2017. Um, I think in the spirit of community engagement, as we were hearing about the Charettes, um, it's really important to be informed by the community. And we had a really robust engagement process throughout. This is a map of California, but the, you can't really see. But these are thanks to the different partners who help participate in it. Um, and it's, it's as strong as it is because of all of the input. So when we did um, the outreach, we actually, because it was a blank slate, we asked around. We were the first state to integrate health and equity like this into a statewide guidance document to think about health. And what was really interesting is, and we worked with the planners across the state. We actually got some national grants, um, a lot of public review. We had new legislation get passed, which is SB 1000. But essentially, those eight, sec those eight sections, so food systems, social cohesion, safety, um, healthy housing, climate and resiliency, you know, I think most people think about active transportation or active living and recreation as a, as a you know, definite link. Most people think about environmental health exposures as a, as a definite link. But I think what was really interesting was this kind of range of feedback that we got in terms of land use planning and, and the built environment. 
Um, just to let you know, one of the things, um, and if you haven't checked out the guidelines, I would highly recommend it. We really tried to make it um, easy to scan. Um, there are tons of live links and lots of resources in there, so we wanted to make it accessible for everybody. Um, but this, um, of the eight areas that we were saying, these are good planning practices. Now, in certain jurisdictions, if they have a disadvantaged community, it's required. So this was also a very big change. But just to give a highlight of, um, I think, some of the places where health is really important um, in terms of the, the planning process, we really talk about community engagement as a big part, right? So making sure that it's informed by community voices and um, community vision, um, thinking about advisory boards and integrating the partners in a, in a um, authentic way, and then also thinking about data and tools and historic considerations. Some places have not had as much engagement, and so when you're trying to do that you know, in, in a new um, method, like sometimes you might not have as much engagement, or there might be history that things have been challenging. Um, the other piece, and this is again, we mentioned. I mentioned that this um, used to be in the healthy community chapter. When it became law, this is now required for a number of jurisdictions across California. It depends on if you have a disadvantaged community. But we still think that these are practices that we, we would hope that every jurisdiction would um, address these in their planning process. Um, this re includes things um, such as pollution exposure, but also food access, um, housing, physical activity, um, and promotion of public facilities. Um, as well as air quality, again, these are, you know, the general plan guidelines says this is what's in law, and then here's really great planning practice. This is what you should, you know, we were recommending to do above and beyond. Everyone would always say, well, why is air quality only required in San Joaquin Valley? That's the legislature. Um, but, um, but what we had actually already added in was a new focus on air quality in disadvantaged communities, um, as well as one of the other things that's come up quite a bit across the state is near uh, roadway air exposure. And and so the, um, the Air Resources Board had put together a publication in 2005, but it had been, as well as it had been since 2003 that we hadn't updated the guidelines, this had been since 2005 that they hadn't you know, added any new information. And what we wanted to do was look at the best scientific evidence to look at mitigation measures so that we could make, be as, mo as protective of health um, in the planning process as possible. So this has a, a really great um, list of different mitigation strategies that local governments can adopt in terms of their planning process. Um, the other um, two chapters um, were equitable and resilient communities. So one is that, um, you know, we, when we started the initial draft, we had a, a chapter on social equity, um, which was, uh, you know, separate. When SB 1000 passed, it was definitely addressing social equity, but we wanted to make sure to leave the social equity piece in because it's broader than just what's in SB 1000. So this is thinking about things like economics and jobs and education, um, as well as um, resilience. And so we actually have a resilience screen that local governments can go through when they do their policies and planning. Um, yeah, and I've gotten good feedback, so, uh, and we're always open to feedback. That's one of the other things. If there's something that you think is missing in the guidelines, if you take a look, then let me know. Um, and then this other chapter is um, healthy communities. And so this was, again, about innovative partnerships. So it's everything in chapter five, but then we have um, discussions on all of these other pieces, as well as example data and policies. Um, this is just to show a lot of community hospitals are now doing community benefit um, assessments, and so that's actually really helpful in the planning process to integrate. And this is just an example. So in terms of active living and recreation, one of the things is, again, starting to use data to be more data informed in the planning process, right? Um, if you don't measure it, how do you know which way you're going? It's a good thing we're measuring uh, our life expectancy. <laughs> we know we need to do better work. Um, but this is just thinking, you know, we have a lot of data recommendations in the guidance document, um, as well as data sources that local governments can use. But, you know, you could think about looking at prevalence of all of these different health outcomes, as well as your land use mix, commute patterns. And then in terms of policies, we actually have an appendix with a lot of example policies. Um, so things like um, proximity to parks and recreation, making sure that trailways are connected. You know, you would think that, you know, of course they would be connected. That is not the case. <laughs> I have lots of pictures and stories from places where things just end right in the middle and they don't connect or you have to jump over a highway, um, which means it doesn't get used, right? Um, 
urban greening programs, lots of things to support bike biking, just even having barking, bike paths and bike um, parking places that are safe so that people, you know, they're worried if their bike's going to get stolen. Um, and then connectivity for all ages. There's a great organization that I've done some work with called 8 to 8, um, 880. And basically it's like, you know, it's a joke because now I partner with the AARP on things from time to time. Um, so even though I'm a trained as a pediatrician, I say I like represent everybody, right? And a lot of it is if you're building for the eight-year-old, you're also building for the 80-year-old. So I think that there's a lot of, you know, in terms of like, thinking about how much time it takes to cross the street or the different amenities. Um, so we have policies and things like that in place um, in the guidelines as well. Um, and this is an example for social connection and safety. So um, there are different safety can be in terms of physical safety from aggression of something happening, or it can be safety in terms of um, accidents, right? Bike or uh, pedestrian accidents. And there's a lot of um, good data that's out there to, to capture that. And so we talk about um, the different types of data for analysis and then examples for potential policy options. Um, again, um, prioritizing joint use agreements. And what's really unique, I think, in Davis is that you have a great relationship with schools um, that, it, you know, varies across the state, um, but there's a lot in terms of safe routes to school and other policies that can get implemented in your planning documents. Um, and then the last example, and again, we have these for um, all of the different sections, but is food systems. Um, so again, you can look at some of the health outcomes. Um, you can actually map out farmers markets, community gardens, and then there are different policy options in terms of things like um, establishing a food policy council or thinking about conversion of land that's not being used for, um, for health and to, to grow community gardens um, or food rescue programs. This is when we actually just ran a statewide campaign um, a couple weeks ago that the governor did a letter of support for the food waste prevention. So we actually have new legislation. Um, so it's SB 1383, if anyone's interested in a food rescue program. So it's going to be it's new, a new statutory mandate to rescue food. This food is going to landfill now. So this is a great way to start to integrate some of the policies to support that recovery for um, underserved communities. So I wanted to end on a vision of what's possible. And I think as we think about a lot of the innovations um, moving forward, um, one is just even in terms of as we think about communities, I think it's really helpful to think about, the, you know, when we're talking about these policies to put in bike lanes or to put in, um, you know, transit oriented development or um, green space. Um, you know, this is, it, this looks like it's okay. It's not, not, you know, um, terrible, but as we start to think about other things like more tree canopy, right, as the days get warmer with climate change, we're going to need to be thinking about this in, in terms of resilience. So, you know, adding in some tree canopy and crosswalks, um, and you know, some more density again, like I think the issue around, um, having access to housing walkability. Um, one of the other issues is just in terms of, um, aging in place, as I mentioned, right? So this is one where if you think about having the amenities that are available so you don't have to get in your car. You can walk to different things, um, I think is, is one of the other um, important places. Um, this one we mentioned safe routes to school. So um, a lot of places that don't have the infrastructure, right? So kids are making um, these trips to school and um, and it's great for them to walk to school. There's actually, I didn't put them in, but there are graphs when you look at childhood obesity and you see the rates of walking to school. It's, it's I mean, I walked to school, right? I think probably if we raised our hands, pretty much everyone in here walked or biked to school and now that's not the case. Um, but you also wanna make sure that the policies are in place to save, you know, make make sure it's safe um, transit. So like for this, in, in terms of instant, you could think about the policy to prioritize it, but then you see an actual bike lane going in, um, the crosswalk, um, again, kind of as I was talking about the 880 principles, just making sure that there's you know a, sp a stopover spot in the middle so that they have the time to cross. Um, and then uh, you know thinking about bringing in um, more amenities that's walkable. Um, this is another place. This is definitely not, <laughs> I know, <laughs> Who would want to walk there? I definitely would not want to be there. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is 4th Street in Berkeley. So this is um, near where um, my, my home is. Well, my, my current home is in Sacramento right now, but where my normal home is. And, um, and so you can see that, right, like this is the same spot. Um, but starting to think about some of the build out 
that would make it a place that's you know more accessible. So just even adding in some of the the trees and the the I actually took a, a park of a picture of a park bench or a, a bus a bench that was on the street here today is a great example. It was for Dia de los Muertos. Um, it's a really nice bench, and so you start to think about some of the amenities that would make it a more enticing place to to be, um, as well as storefront and things you could actually walk to, um, so that it makes sense to be a more walkable community and the density. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say is that I think a lot of this really, again, goes back to partnership. Um, it's really, um, you know, there's a lot of expertise, especially community expertise as you're building the places and thinking about things. Um, so this is just this morning, I was actually, um, we were doing outreach for SB 1000, we're putting out new implementation guidance, and I was in Oakland, um, and the one of the partners, the American Planning Association, actually just did this. This is the second annual summit on livable communities. Um, so they were doing planners and aging professionals working together. So there's a whole new initiative um, where they're bringing um, people together. Um, the Urban Land Institute, as I mentioned, is doing a lot of work. They actually have a national program, so it's a um, Planning for Healthy Places program, so they're training health leaders to be able to go out into communities um, and to do this work. Um, and then the bottom is Plan for Health. This has been really um, exciting. This is also going on across um, across the United States where it's really incre increased capacity to start to, to really understand both sides um, of, of um, the issue. Um, so I would say, you know, really as we think about what's next, I think cross-sector collaboration is going to be a really big part of bringing different partners together to do this work. Um, local government has a huge role. So I think we often think about, you know, where, what level this happens at. Really in terms of planning, this is a very local level um, issue. And this is really where you can start to make a difference. And the last thing I would say is I think the time is now, especially as we hear about the Economist <laughs> report, um, we have a really great opportunity um, to do this work. So on that, I was gonna say thank you. Okay, we'll have a seat. Okay. Relax. Um, good. Well, we're going to come back to questions in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but before that, I'm going to invite up uh, Peter and Sheila. And just a, you know, three, five minutes uh, reflection, what, something that you heard and that relates to what you know about the city and your own uh, field. And it looks like Peter's going to go first. I'll take All it. Right. I'll, I'll take it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one thing you said is, that, oh, this is a new idea, this the idea we're going to incorporate health and all that. And I had a flashback. The, 20 uh, years ago. No, 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 <laughs> okay. no. Thousands of years ago, um, the Roman laws. Oh. Uh, the Roman laws. Cicero talked about the Roman laws, and he said health of the... Oh, you want, the there you go. Do you want to is this, this just one? not dead? or Okay. I feel like an MC. Um, so the ancient Roman laws um, actually said the health of the people is the highest law. And that was the 12 tables of Roman law. So that's, you know, it's like an old idea that we're resurrecting again now and paying more attention to. And so I, you know, that, that's one thing that caught my, caught my ear. Um, and the other thing is, the, you know, these, I think a lot of physical activity um, and health habits get established young and then you know like you say well you walk to school i walk to school i was a free range kid and you know and that was that was great and i think it also you learn how to behave and i think davis does a good job on that by the way i see kids out by themselves not supervised and i think that's beautiful i remember coming biking around davis showing a, a friend who was a bike coordinator from the city of seattle peter lagway and here's two young girls sisters they were just out there by themselves, and he was just blown away. He was a man from Seattle. He just doesn't ever see that in Seattle. That, like, wow, you know. So that's, so that's great, you know. So, he, so Davis makes a situation where people can walk, can bike. Um, I think, I think that's one thing we can be really proud about here in Davis that we have done a good job. I, I, I see a lot of the discussions of what we needed to be to be healthy. We do here. Um, you know, I walked across the farmers market today coming over here and like wow full of all this life and you know all that you know and good food um so davis was one of the first cities to do the farmer's market um the first a first um whatever doing doing pretty well um love the the trails the open space um like i say just on the open space there's two young girls out there by themselves being free-range kids that's great um but what can we do more? I mean, that's, I think that's really the, the question we need to struggle about in this room is what could we do more 
in this town. Um, I saw some ideas from that said, oh, we need to um, make a street play. Uh, that is, temporarily close a street and just let the kids have the street for you know some hours a day and the kids can all come out and play. Well, that's something I think we could do locally. I mean, I don't know, but that might be a good way to get kids connected with others and parents too, you know, everyone would come out. Um, um, there's about a push in other countries to uh, lower the speed limits in residential areas to 20 miles per hour. That's something that I would love to see California take on, but that's going to take a, a, a state law that would have to change. The vehicle code says it's 25 miles per hour, but there's good arguments for 20 miles per hour. We heard earlier, we had a talk on parking, and I think that's going to come back into it. I think big parking lots discourage walking. You know, it's, it's hard to walk the target. Um, um, and then the free parking thing. Well, we're paying people to, to drive, and we want to encourage people to do you know, unhealthy activities. Other things I think they would come into the general plan is going to be this mix of housing and shops. You know, um, do you want one big box that sort of takes over all the business in town? I mean, do you want one mega gym that, you know, or do you want 10 smaller neighborhood gyms? I mean, these are some questions I think um, we need to wrestle with. Anyway, I, th I think the health of the people is the highest law, so I think we need to go that way. <laughs> Sheila. Um, thank you. I know how to use the microphone, been, <laughs> been in here before. Um, so from an older adult perspective, um, Anyone in here who is very lucky will get to grow older. So that's what I, when we're talking about healthy aging, um, YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance is our organization. And we have the word health right in there because I think that in the beginning you were talking about what is the definition of health. I think it's a very personal thing and it really is more than just your body. It is about your mind. It's about your community. It's about your environment. It's really a broad um, a look at the, uh, a person as a whole. And so I appreciate the broader look that is now happening in regards to health. And I do really think that now that we're looking at the general plan, and in particular, looking at our downtown at our core, this is really an opportunity to think more about health in a, as, as a community in a broader sense. So thank you for that, that part of the conversation, that health is really a broad broader topic. Um, I would like to put a plug in for something that um, Davis might, a road that Davis might want to go down, and I think it's a word that you talked about also, the AARP, which isn't necessarily just about older people, worked with the World Health Organization to look at what they originally called age-friendly community, but now have are using the topic livable communities. So it uses some research that looks at eight different domains, and I had to look them up because I can't remember the all, but I just want to run through them because a lot of them were in your slides, and I think that when we're thinking as a community about planning, these are what really makes a community livable for, I like your 880, and actually in my world it's 80 to 8. So if we build something for 80-year-olds, it also will work for the 8-year-olds. So think about these things when we're, when we're thinking about planning. Outdoor spaces and building, so your, your area. Transportation, always an issue, and, and broadly transportation, not just cars. Housing, big H word here. Um, four, social participation. So it's about you know community, about, about coming, bringing people together. Five, respect and social inclusion, so a place for everybody. Six, civic participation, and I think this is, you know, this is our choir in here, because you came out tonight to hear about it. Civic participation and employment. Seven, communication and information. So how did, how did you find out about this meeting here? How do you find out about other things in the community? How do we get the information out? And eight is community and health services. So it's a really a broad look at health and a, bra a way of, it works for everyone, for the, from the eight and even younger, you know, preschool and, and young children up to even over, over 80 years old is kind of weaving together all the pieces that are out there. I really appreciate that you all came out here and want to be a part of the planning process because I think that that's how we're going to make a good plan is if we have broad participation. So I hope going forward that we work on ways of getting the, the word out 
so that we can have um, input from all different sectors of our community going forward. So not just, you know, not, not just older people, not just younger people, but for for our community as a whole. So I hope that you are are now get to go out and talk to you know ten of your neighbors to see what they think about this this planning going forward. Okay, so um, we're going. Shall I stay here? I I, I I feel like we're kind of in an informal space. So why don't we uh, why don't we have you guys sit in the chairs in front and kind of move them to the middle? I'll just make a couple ref, uh, points of reflection just from the perspective of where I've been sitting the last couple of years. Um, one strikes me from the images that we saw at the end that you know we all show up in this city with an already built environment. Right? There there are some opportunities for new construction or new conceptualization of new spaces. Um, one, one that's been really intriguing to me uh, recently, and I'll be there tomorrow night, is, is Cannery. I was not on the council when Cannery was planned. But I can tell you that the people moving in up there, they're uh, experiencing, I think, a little bit of, of uh, space shock, um, meaning that um, it's not, it doesn't feel like a typical suburban environment. It, it's a fairly dense, uh, the roads, the streets are narrower than most of the streets that you live on, and it's an urban type design, uh, uses space arguably more efficiently than other parts of the town, but people are rubbing up against the reality that where do I put all my stuff? Or it feels kind of tight, um, I don't have enough room for my cars. And so we're wrestling with that. But for the most part, we're all dealing with already built environments, and so, I'm really looking for people who have that gift and those skills to think about those already, revisioning of those already built environments. So for example, um, in the city this year for I think the first time, we'll be building something new in terms of our bike infrastructure called protected bike lanes. Not a new concept around the country, new for us. Um, where we take whole stretches of street and create not just bike lanes, but lanes that are physically separated by some form of barrier, not, not a concrete wall but flexible bollards, um, maybe putting parking on the other side of, of uh, bike lanes. Um, you'll see that out on Mace Boulevard starting this summer, south of Cowell. Uh, you'll see it eventually very soon, I think, on F Street and on Villanova, and I believe also on Anderson in the years ahead, where we're thinking differently about mixing transit, pedestrian, bike, and automobiles with the concept uh, the little bit talked about of complete streets, and we have adopted that as a policy. So complete streets is a way of thinking about retrofitting our built environment to make it possible for people of all abilities uh, to move about, and all forms of transportation to move about together in a way that feels safe for everyone. Uh, just today, an example of a retrofit that's underway. Um, some of you have heard about the uh, da West Davis Active Adult Community Development that will be potentially coming to a vote in November as a Measure R vote. If you look at the entryway to it, uh, right near the hospital coming out of Shasta, you'll notice that that's, a, that's an intersection that's full of what we call free right turns, right? And you come up and if you're gonna go straight, you, you, you stop at a light, but if you're not going straight, you can go s speed through sort of a yield. Uh, and there's like a pork chop, we call it a pork chop island where pedestrians seek refuge as they seek to cross the street. We're, mo we're, we're proposing to remove all free rights there and to pinch in the intersection in a much better way than we did at Cannery to make it possible for people to get across with islands of refuge in the middle to get across that intersection. Why is that important? Because the predominant uh, residents of that area will be people who are in there uh, over, over 50, uh, late 50s, 60s, and older. Those are design retrofits that matter. So that's one thing that I think we need continued help with vision to do that, and our Bike Transportation and Street Safety Commission and, and Bike Davis helps us with that. A completely different area that you talked about that I just wanted to highlight in my own thoughts about where we're going in health uh, as a city. And by the way, those retrofits are about health, right? They're about encouraging more people. It's about getting not 30% of kids biking to school and walking to school, but 40 and 50%, which we have at Patwin, but we don't have in South Davis at Pioneer. Patwin, 40%. Pioneer, 15%. Why? Big old Mace Boulevard, very difficult to get across. How do I do it? Parents don't want to do it. We retrofit, we put in protected bike lanes, hawk signals with red uh, flashing beacons. All of a sudden, parents are saying, maybe I can trust sending my kids across that space. 
So, but the second area that is completely different in terms of the health of our community is really related to the, I think it's being brought to the fore because of global climate change. And what we realize to be the challenges of global climate change, which include unpredictable changes to the weather locally and regionally and statewide. And we saw that, of course, and we're seeing that in our extended fire seasons, potentially floods this weekend, Oroville Dam last year. I think there's a couple things there that we as a community need to think about. One is we are positioned potentially to be a significant receiver community for internally displaced people in this state. We are. Um, we're not a particularly hazardous fire zone. We may be in somewhat of a flood zone. Uh, we're not an earthquake zone. Um, and therefore, all of those potential disasters existing around us mean that we are going to be a place that people came. And it happened. When Oroville happened, people were flooding to the fairgrounds in Woodland. And you talk to county commissioners, and they will say, that, one told me, that was a shakedown cruise. In other words, we were not ready. Um, and it's not just about emergency planning. Um, it's something more than that. And I think it was alluded to, but I want to call it out. It's our ability as a community to be in relationship more broadly than the city of Davis. It means that we have the deep personal relationships, leadership and other across cities, so that when something happens, we can call on those personal relationships, the social capital, which is embedded in our community, to create action that saves, and help, help, saves lives and help people. That doesn't just happen. That means when we form JPAs, Joint Powers Authority, or when we get together in leadership groups around water, wastewater, uh, solid waste management, and talk to other cities, we need to focus on relationship building and conflict resolution. Those are skills that we don't often talk about in relation to health. The ability to resolve conflict productively, the ability to work collectively, to trust relationships, to build social capital. I'm particularly interested in that because of the work I did in Africa and South Asia, where systematically the health projects that I worked on over a period of 10 to 12 years were destroyed by uh, conflict within communities. And that conflict, you would say, well, that will never happen here. Woodland is never going to go to war with Davis. That's true. <laughs> At least I hope so. But what might happen is that we stop talking to each other. What might happen is that we stop working together actively to solve problems, and then we're left adrift and not able to respond to the changes when they come. The skill sets we need uh, related to conflict resolution are the same as the skill sets we need in retrofitting our community. They have to be developed and, and, and tested over time. And so uh, we have some resources in our community, Yellow Conflict Resolution Center being one, just like Davis, uh, Bike Davis, just like other groups, Cool Davis, in this community who are working on different facets of making us more resilient. And those are all about our health. Those are all about our health. So with that, we're going to now let you ask questions. So I think, Judy, are you going to go around with the mic? OK, so here's the rule. Judy's got the mic, but um, I get to tell you when to ask your question. So <laughs> please, if you have a question, you can address it to anyone here and uh, do address it. And then any of the others can feel free to respond if you have a quick response. Put, if you'd raise your hand, we'll start back here. And we'll just work this way. So I see you. Uh, here, start with this gentleman over here uh, who's insistent on. I, 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 I saw his hand first. I, that's all it's about. If you want to state your name, I'll get you. Well, what, what we're going to do is we're going to come here. I think, I, did you have your hand? No. There, there. But I promised over here. So she's third. So go ahead, get to your question, and then we'll move on. Sure. My name is Dan Carson. I have one suggestion in jest and then one serious question really aimed for you, Elizabeth. The, the, the mirthful suggestion is we should mandate everyone run for public office and knocking for doors. I've already knocked off 13 pounds. I'm calling it uh, winning while losing. Um, the, the, here, here's, the, here's the serious question. Um, and because you work for OPR, you, you'll have some insight into this. Some, some cities in California have created elements of their general plan, and we're about to write a new general plan in this city for uh, healthy communities. What do you think the, the potential is th uh, for something uh, like that in Davis? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it'd be great. And that was part of the, um, 
the the reason that we even incorporated how there were so many jurisdictions doing this. We actually um, one thing is we have the annual planning survey, so you can actually look at all across the state, all of the places that have integrated health. Um, I think one thing is whether health should be its own element or should those element you know should those policies, objectives, goals be woven throughout. There's not enough evi like scientific evidence to say we did it this way or we did it that way. It really depends on the local context. So whether you want to have your own healthy community element so it's a rallying point that's great or if you want to still do all of that outreach and have it integrated that works too but i do what i do think is it's starting to get those policies embedded again these are decisions that are 20 to 30 years out so the policies in place help form the community now but just as rob's saying i think that there are lots of other um, policies to help guide even even more the direction towards um building health into the you know really systematically building it into the network and the infrastructure and the fiber of the plan go to this young man over here with the red shirt on thanks Hi, my name is Lorenzo Christoph. This is a question for Elizabeth also. I appreciated all the uh, information about the state programs and laws and so on. I guess one of the things I'm concerned about, though, is that uh, implementing all these health measures at the community level through general planning requires a certain resource and capability on the part of the individual cities and communities. And um, I think that's pretty uneven across California. There are some that are really challenged. And I'm wondering if, if the state has some program to really pump resources into these cities and counties that need reinforcement in their staff and their capabilities to create really good general plans and so on. Thank you. Yeah, no, um, thank you. That's, I mean, that's a big issue. I and mean, one is that there's, you see a, a big variation in resources across the state, across not just in terms of the general plan, but for all, for all capacity. Um, so one thing, one, you know, and that's, that's I think, a, a bigger funding issue that would need to go through, through statute, through statutory changes to create some other funding programs. I think there are some things like AB 617, which just got passed, which is going to be some funding on planning. Um, there are other programs like the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Development Program. So there are some kind of funding streams, and now we have um, the new housing funds, right? So I think there are some things that are going to be really helpful for that. Um, the one thing I would say for OPR, by measure, by, by the fact that we built a planning tool, so it has a lot of the data. We were trying to increase capacity. There's a lot of the policies in there so that if a jurisdiction doesn't necessarily have the technical capacity or a lot of staff, that it try, trying to make it as easy as possible to say, we want to integrate this. Um, you know, we don't have the time. We can't pay for a consultant necessarily, but we have a lot of the tools that are much easier to use. So like the GIS mapping. Um, tool. LA, LA City is not going to really use that necessarily, um, but other jurisdictions will that don't have a GIS planner. So I think that's really what we tried to do in terms of um, the update. Thank you. We'll go over here all the way across. You, yep, you were third. And then I think I saw a couple. Yeah, then we'll come over here. We'll come here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then we'll Thank you. and then, sir, we'll come back to you over here after. Okay. Hello, my name is Eleni. Um, I graduated from UCD in June. Now I'm working on sustainable transportation there. Um, and it was really encouraging to see all of the sort of top-down legislation that's going on. Um, this question is, was kind of sparked by something that Sheila said about how one of the aspects of health is communication to the population. Um, so when it comes to this, this tandem need for bottom-up grassroots sort of influencing and nudging of behavior. Um, I'm wondering in specific if all three of you have any insight into countering um, the overwhelming sense of apathy <laughs> that so many people have toward these kinds of topics. Thank you. Uh, well, um, I think the um, communication, increasing communication in general, and I'm a big fan of um, encouraging neighbor discussions. Um, I, as I, he mentioned that I'm on the Human Relations Commission, and we are trying to uh, tag on to the Neighbors Night Out initiative and try to have that something that's not just one night, but try to find a way that when it's okay, you gather for one night. Now that this is a time for you to exchange contact information and know I've um, I live out in 
Mace Ranch, and ever since I moved there 24 years ago, I've been the keeper of the Petrichor neighbor list, and it has the, the phone numbers and the names of all the, the people, the names, the dogs and the cats, so if you ever see them out, and then it's, it's, you, that is utilized for like, you know, hey, your garage door is open, and you're down at the mailbox, so it's just a, kind of at a micro level to try to encourage any ways of having more conversations, I think is a, a way to, a good way to start that kind of conversation. I would sort of riff off the comment you made, the idea that there's a lot, some people just don't have time. Here we, here we can spend an evening in, in this discussing health in the community, and there's an awful lot of people that are working two jobs, three jobs, that have no opportunity. So I think that becomes you know, important for us to build an environment where people can be active, be healthy, um, and that's, you know, so how are you gonna do that in a community where people are working two jobs? That's just, you know, hard. You gonna take this one? You gonna try, give it a try? Or do you wanna go back at her with an? No, 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 I'll go to Judy. I'll go back to Judy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Where to, boss? Uh, okay, so we're coming over here to this young uh, person here in the front. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling my age tonight, so everybody seems young to me. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Elizabeth Lesensky. So my question is, um, well, first, I, it seems to me that we need to do a lot of re-educating and a lot of rethinking about um, what we're teaching and what we're conveying, um, both at um, the local school level, but also professionally and in a broader sense. So is there any initiative? to uh, move along with re-educating and, and refocusing people's careers and, and thought processes? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, um, so I think, yeah, it's not enough. I think it needs to be more. I think that also comes from the community. I mean, today, one of the community members, so we actually structured it, so we had community voices um, who are suffering from environmental justice issues um, before we started. And one of the things, one of the, she was an, she an advocate, and she said, how many of you are planners? Raise your hand. So everyone who was a planner, there were a lot. How many of you are in public health? Very few. How many of you as planners are trained in public health? Maybe like two or three, right? And so I think part of it is um, some of that cross cross disciplinary training. I think it doesn't always have to be cross disciplinary training. I think it can also come from partnership, right? So you may have the planner and the physician working together, or the public health um, person working with the engineer. I think it's just you've got to start um, doing that. In terms of education, I mean, I think part of it is. Um, you know, again, I think at the local level, there's a huge opportunity to lead, right? Because, you know, when this is one of the big things we saw when we updated the plan is we look to local governments to say who's doing this work and we learn from that and we use that to inform. So I think that even in terms of education, um, thinking about schools, if you're working with the school districts, like there's a lot of opportunity and more of that I think needs to happen. I want to, I, I want to respond to that briefly too. I mean, I think, so we were talking at dinner I mean, education is a broad term, but let's think in terms of relevance. Let's think in terms of people considering health when it's relevant for them, or maybe not even framing it as health, but thinking about things they want to do about maybe getting around town, but doing it differently. So Sheila mentioned that, I think, out at Rancho Yolo this weekend, there's a, there's a training on, on use of alternate forms of transportation, like how, and I mean, maybe we think that we don't need this, but I guarantee you we do. How do I use a bus? What does it mean to use Unitrans? What's, you know, what's, I, I've never done that before. I've always been autonomous. Um, I know I was talking to a parent, I don't think it was anybody, no, not one in this room, uh, training their kids to ride the bus, give, making it a challenge, uh, letting them have that autonomy. So that's, that's an example of maybe, we don't call that education, but it's at a point in people's lives when it's relevant for them to continue to seek autonomy and building in a program that enables them to, to do something that they want to do, but in a way that is potentially more healthy. Um, another thing that I would give an example of, again, would I have framed this as an education process? Uh, if you go out on the table that, that um, Bike Davis had tonight, you'll see a, a large document on our school audits. Uh, we did audits at each elementary school around the city where we talked to principals, teachers, students, and parents, and used observation 
to consider what was impeding people from coming into those spaces. I mean, what, what were the scary parts of arriving at that school? Crossings, uh, traffic speeds. And we put them into a document, not just to put on the shelf, but the city council's been using that as a planning tool over the last three years. We'll continue to use it to systematically pick off all of those issues. Well, that was a, that was a learning process. That was an education process where people were teaching each other about the challenges and opportunities of changing. Definitely has a health impact. Is it sitting down in a traditional classroom talking about the need to eat better? No. But I would argue the best education that we're doing in the community is hitting people at the time when something is extremely relevant to them and enabling them to make a change which is for the betterment of their health. And so there are two examples of where I've seen it recently happening, which I think is helpful. Chris. So two things. One, quickly, I would just add to that that sometimes we just need to have fun. and. <laughs> Eating, Not too much, though. I mean. <laughs> eating good food together. You know, what's going on? All, many of us would probably really like to be over in the park right now. Being in, in healthy places. Get, grabbing your friends in the neighborhood and riding your bikes downtown instead of it taking a car so that there really is a space for parking for someone who really needs to park. Those are the kinds of things we can do as a community that make... Um, that make these things come alive. So that's first. Then second, I have a question around your experience in decision making right now around valuing what we call health. Because what I see is it's so easy for us to put a price on the parking space, but we can't really quite value the mental health value of green space and trees. We can't get there in our conversation with that. And so I'm interested in you know, your arenas. How do you think we get there? Because we have a huge um, investment our community has made in the systems, in the places we've already built that we want to maintain. And um, we're, we're struggling to be able to make good arguments for keeping those things, let alone building more, better spaces to live in. A quick response would be the, the old Lord Calvin line, that that's not measured doesn't matter. So you don't have a way of measuring the health benefits. We don't have a way of measuring that. It seems like health is in one silo. Oh, we're paying 18% of our you know, GDP is going into health. Okay, that's fascinating. But then no one, the people that the monies that might change that aren't, don't seem to be connected. So I think you know you're, you're on to a good point, but I don't know, I don't have a solution. Well, I don't. It's I don't. I don't have an easy solution, but I think part of it, as I mentioned, in the health innovation space, one of the things is just in terms of the digital and the data, right? So if you don't have the data, you're not collecting it. I would say one of the other um, projects that I worked on was um, Urban Footprint, which does land use scenario planning. They've created a module to, to actually try to quantify some of the benefits. It's been more around active transit. Um, but I think that there are some initiatives to start doing that, right? Um, the other thing is just starting to actually even, again, even having it be part of the conversation, right? So you might not always be able to quantify it, but I think just as I showed the picture of the burning car, um, <laughs> there, there are a lot of science. And you guys have a, a, a center here. You have UC Davis. So that's, I think, a really great resource in terms of reaching out to some of the researchers who might be interested in um, maybe able to help form some of those conversations on looking at the literature review and saying, you know, here's what the science behind this. So we may not be able to actually quantify this just like we can in the parking space at this point, but I think there's kind of an effort to start to move in that direction. But it is, it's a values question, right? So I think that that is, it is um, challenging, but not impossible. And I think more and more we're seeing um, those linkages be made in terms of health impacts. We have a Question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to give the example. Um, I used to be a professor of nursing at Rush University on, in Chicago, and my practice area was on the south side of Chicago. And I would load my students up into my car, and we would drive around the south side of Chicago. And this is nothing like in Davis, but I would have my students say, we'd be on one block, and I'd say, what do you see? And it's like, well, there's no grocery store, and there's not really a functioning sidewalk, and there's houses that are all boarded up. And, and then we would cross a road, and then 
then suddenly it's like an immaculate yard and there's a coffee shop and there's a there's a little restaurant and there's a cute little grocery store there that has organic food so i think that what from a community standpoint you can i think that we know what looks what what the feel and the look of healthy is when we're in it. Sometimes if there's like a stark difference here, we don't have as much of a stark difference. But I, I love your slides that showed the before and then the imagined after. And so I was trying to think of, you know, like, okay, Second Street, what does it look like now? What would it look like if it was different? So if we can think of some of those elements about what would be welcoming, what would be friendly, where would we like to be no matter what our mode of movement and then try to imagine it. I think that's a really, that'd be a healthy way of, of approaching it. Question over here. Hi, my name is Carl Warsaw. I've been a pediatrician for a, around 50 years. I kind of lose track of, of how long it's been. I had a couple of comments first. One, I would ask people if they've never seen the movie Happy, they should go see it. Number two, there's a movie tomorrow night called Eating Yourself Alive, which is an excellent movie about, about appropriate diet. I'm there because I've spent 50 years dealing with children's diet. I've seen it deteriorate something fierce. I have two, comment, two quotes, or I, I try to quote them. One is the king of Denmark once said, children are our greatest treasure and resource. And a pediatric uh, uh, endocrinologist friend of mine, a very well-known one, uh, said about uh, four years ago, Children of this generation will not live as long as the present generation, which is a really scary thing. And so, and I find when I tried to counsel about food that I'm working against a multi billion dollar industry. So, my question in a way is what can we do? to improve it just in our city. It's a good place to start. I know, I think it was the governor who said no soft drinks in school or something, and it created a, an uproar, but that's where we need to be. We need to start, uh, you know, what can we do to improve the way we teach our children, which includes what we let them eat in school. So I think that's really important. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, do you have... Well, I, I would... Thank you. I just briefly, with my school board, old school board hat, um, I'm not sure if they're still doing it. I think they are, but you, the people of Davis, voted in part of your parcel tax is that it's going to go for fresh fruits and vegetables. It was always hard to say that when we were campaigning for it. And it was about changing what the food was at, what, even from when they first started in school. And then it's an educational process. So we had parent volunteers at the, at the um, salad bar to say, here, you want to try this? Do you know what that is? Here, put some with this on your plate, give it a go. And there are no soft drinks in any Davis schools or haven't been for a long time. Water is what we have. Water and milk, yeah. That's it. So. Right. Well, it was a bit of a fuss because the the um, the soda or pop where I come from machines, the money that came from there went to the sports teams. Right. So then they lost some of the money. But it was it was a, it was a cultural change. So I'll let the pediatrician talk now. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it, it's great. I mean, I think one um, I don't know which and famous endocrinologist you're talking about, but um, I remember when I was in residency still, um, I was really interested in these issues. So I organized some of my own rotations, and one was with um, endocrinology. And I remember driving to, it was on pediatric obesity, and we were driving to a conference on bariatric surgery, which basically is where you cut the stomach to make it smaller. And I thought, this is the solution, right? Like, this is for children. Yeah, so now they do bariatric surgery, where they're literally altering, they're literally cutting their stomach. And the thing is, is you just become, you can not absorb well, right? So you become malabsorptive, because you're missing a lot of key vitamins. And then you can actually still eat through, if you're not eating, if you don't change your diet, you can still gain more weight and go back to the same situation. Anyway, I know it's shocking and sad, but I think that um, I think it kind of in the bigger picture. So um, one of the other pieces I work on is food systems. Um, and uh, so again, it, I think it really comes back to that cross sector solution. So when when I brought we were it was actually in launching from this work, we want I said, OK, well, we get these great policies. And that was one of the questions. We get these policies in place. How do you actually implement them? How do you make them happen? Um, it can't just be within government. It's we've got to have the other partners involved. So one of the things 
things that came from this work is a food systems accelerator. So it's actually an accelerator. It brings together nonprofit and for-profit businesses. It's really looking for the same things that we used for the general plan guidelines, thinking about environmental sustainability, health, equity, economic sustainability, um, to be able to foster some of those solutions. So I think it's, again, a lot of the same things where we're trying to make you know, positive changes in the environment um, also end up being supportive of health. So I would say looking at some of those solutions. Um, but I think also like locally, there's, you know, in terms of um, access to fruits and vegetables that, you know, there's a lot that can happen um, where you can start to change some of those systems. So you're not always having to fight it in the clinic. I wanted to add to that. I mean, so I would, I would encourage people to keep their eye on um, the way um, uh, nutrition education programs that are even government sponsored are evolving. So take CalFresh, for example, here in this state, which is run through extension services all throughout the state in largely underserved counties. That's where the targets are. There, you use the word systems. They, the approach is, is moving away from a didactic best practices that you should use, parents with your children, students in school, don't drink sugary beverages, eat healthy, that sort of information process that I give you information and I expect you're gonna change your behavior, to looking at the broader system as it enables or does not those changes. And so what CalFresh is doing is working actually, rather than working with experts, they're working with students. What do you see? What do you see in your cafeteria? How's it set up? How's it structured? What about the food workers in the schools? How do they feel? What do they feel about what they're serving? What would they like to serve differently? What about local farmers? What can they contribute? And it's really a process. I mean, my, my own revelation about nutrition education was the very first project I worked on in my career, which was a vitamin A project in West Africa where there was not enough vitamin A in the diet. We did a lot of education. You need to eat more green leafy vegetables and those fleshy yellow uh, vegetables and, and certain fruits like mangoes. What we needed to do was to talk to people about their growing habits and their ability to grow those foods and their ability to produce them for themselves and for others. It was the most successful project I ever worked on because it didn't just talk to people about eating differently, it attacked it from an economic perspective where they could make some money. It transformed the diet of that area. These systems approaches, the failure of our modern food system, which trickles down to our communities, is that we solved every food problem with a very targeted answer of how you produce more food. It's been about producing more, not about how to produce healthy and varied food, not about how to enable delivery systems to deliver that. And I think the change that's happening, even in centrally funded programs out of Washington at this point, if they're not cut, is these more systemic and systems-wide examinations of our local, very, very hyper-local food system in our school and how we may structure it differently. That is not a master plan, but you talked about local. This is how change happens locally. This is how people start to envision a different way of being in a community. And those tools, again, like so many that we're talking about, are tools about facilitation, learning, facilitating conversations, empowerment education, and those things that, that don't often enter the conversation. Uh, but they're happening. They're happening. And that is the only way to fight against the monolithic food system that would merely uh, focus on creating excess commodity. Okay, we had a question over here, and then I thought, I, hang on, someone else had one. Oh, I promised Dan I'd come over here. I have a mic, I must be next. Yeah, you're next, <laughs> and then we'll come here, and then we'll go back to there, in the back. Okay. Uh, I'm Steve Street, a member of the Planning Commission. Food insecurity is what I wanted to talk about. And the gleaners in town do a great job. Many of us probably have some fruits and vegetables we could send their way, and which, which ends up at the Yellow Food Bank or Short-Term Urgency Action Committee, Aid Committee. But I'm thinking about restaurants and all the food that gets thrown out or the farm to fork program. What, what, what could be done? I know there's restaurant rules and all of that, but at the end of the day, they're throwing out things at the co-op or the nugget and so forth. Is there a way to make that available to people in need? I'm not thinking just the homeless folks, but but students that are insecure, the city council hears about UCD students are living on the edge. Yeah, yes. for sure. That's been a, um, a, a really big um, emphasis. So that's 13, SB 1383, which is the new legislation. So it's actually the short-lived climate pollutant bill. So again, again, those co-benefits, right? Within that, there's a new mandate for 20% food recovery that would have gone to landfill for human consumption. Um, there's actually, as, in terms of planning for the Global Climate Action Summit that's going to be here um, 
in California in September, there are a number of different challenges and food waste reduction is gonna be one of the big challenges that we're hoping that the, the, the folks taking these pledges will, will address. So I think that um, one is there's legislation in place um, to help prevent food waste. There's some great resources in terms of um, NRDC has put out some great um, resources, Refed, which is an organization that looked across the supply chain. There's There are university groups that are recovering food. So I think, again, it's like this kind of reframing and trying to be more creative and innovative. Um, food policy councils is one. That's a great policy you can put into your land use plan, right? But then food policy councils, there are a number um, that exist. There's a great, you can look online. Um, but those are sometimes the places where they can actually start to really work. Um, there's a program, um, one is Fresno. We actually just, it's on the OPR website. So if you look under general plans and then food waste prevention, we have a um, uh, an example from Fresno that's they've then they've done it more holistically so they've created they're thinking about economic development for local um, populations gleaning food recovery um, waste not OC actually partnered with their health system so they actually when you're screening in clinic right so you you're that's one of the questions you should be asking is do you have enough food they screen for it but then they actually link to the food banks where the food is actually going from these donated programs so there are lots of programs like that food runners in San Francisco um, there are a number and I think that this is again one of those untapped places where you I think one of the things especially working in, in the United States we often have an excess of things so we're not thinking about how we use our water resources or how we use food and so yeah definitely there's a ton ton of work that could be done there good examples and that was SB 1383 great so oh, and there's really quickly there's grant funding to support programs um, they just did their call for proposals but there should be more funding next year again through Cal recycle Okay. I want to flip the usual thing and, and ask the question first and then give the comment. So um, my question is basically, uh, thinking about Davis hyper-locally, um, how do we, where does the money come from? Or how do we do this cheaply? And let me explain what I mean by that. So, and introduce myself. My name is Dan Fuchs. I'm the president of the board of Bike Davis. I also sit on the uh, Bicycling, Transportation, and Street Safety Commission. So my, my question is informed by those positions, but um, is not actually asked in terms of those positions. Um, but in my experience, I've seen uh, that we have a built environment that was built over the last roughly 60 to 70 years in Davis at a time when uh, you know individual car ownership was the model. And so we have roads that are 48 feet wide, and we have uh, the free right turns and so on. And what Rob suggested was uh, one specific location where we're getting rid of the free right turns which will help health because it will help people cross the street, which will help people uh, use their bicycles and their feet more. That could be paid for through a development agreement with the developer of the uh, West Davis Active Adult Center or, or development. Um, in the absence of a development agreement like that, where do we get the revenue or how can we accomplish cheaply uh, the structural changes to our built environment that we need to get so that it feels safer for people to ride so that we get the critical mass that Peter has, talking about, has talked about. Peter, do you want to take the, the engineering side? <laughs> yeah, money. Question. It's a money question. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's like, pass the mic. Yeah. The Sorry. <laughs> um, do you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy, if, if, but I mean, I, so on, on the funding side, um, there are, again, there's some of the, the grants, right? There, there are less, there used to be some, some more of that. Um, I think some interesting, you know, no one ever wants to do new measures, but sometimes, you know, like in Los Angeles, that was how they actually funded some of it. Um, and then, and then more local development fees. I mean, I think one of the challenges, this is across the board and this is not just, I mean, I think Davis has a, a, a lot of really great things. This is across the board. There are challenges for resources. And so I think everything is, how do you get more creative with what you have. And, and um, I have seen a couple places where it's not, and I don't know, it would be interesting from the engineering perspective, your thoughts, but um, is actually doing just kind of some easy painting, you know what I mean? Like not huge cost infrastructure changes, but you know, 
paints and some tree plant, you know, some kind of um, the, the, the some barriers that aren't quite, you know, it's not like the, the official kind of changes. But I think that, you know, and I've seen in New York, they actually did that. They did some some projects to just um, what is it called? Tactical urbanism. Have you heard of that? Yeah, tactical urbanism. So just basically doing some of these things in a more kind of um, economical way, but just to start, because again, kind of going to your work where you have more people and foot traffic and bikes, then it kind of creates this tipping point of safety. So that would be my... Yeah, and I, I think the answer to your question is that you're seeing it happen right before your eyes. I, I know it doesn't feel that way, but you know, I was on Folsom Street in San Francisco this past weekend. That's the type of street you're talking about. In fact, it's wider and it's, one, and it's, it's massive. Um, with paint and with fairly low-cost infrastructure, they're channeling bikes away from traffic, moving transit out so that bikes aren't competing with it, like they do on Anderson. That's the future. So every time we put a protected bike lane in, instead of, instead of a separated bike path, that's savings of potentially millions of dollars. Do we like that as much? Maybe not. Is it effective in the what you know in the reality of the funding that we have? Probably. That's why protected intersections are taking over from grade separated bridges. A bridge is six million dollars, a protected intersection is maybe two or three hundred thousand dollars. So I think what you're seeing is you are seeing an attempt to use lower cost solutions to achieve certain impacts. They don't feel as ideal, and maybe they're not in some respects, but I think these are adaptations we're making to funding realities that, where they're coming from. They're not being invented in Davis, but they're being invented in places where resources are limited and people are saying, how do we create physical separation? How do we pinch down streets so that it's safer to get across for people of all ages? That's where these innovations have come from. Um, and, and, it's, and it's largely because there are funding constraints. So I think the innovations are gonna to continue to be in the space of how do we get what we want more cheaply as opposed to saying, hey, we just need a bridge. We just need a bridge over that thing, you know? Or we need a tunnel under it. It's even worse, I mean, more expensive. So well, that's what we're trying. And it doesn't work in every case, but I think that's where the innovation is gonna to need to come from over the next generation in these built environments. Now, let's see, I, oh yeah, oh, and then we're gonna go back there. I've been now. trying to figure out where to throw this in, so I'm gonna throw it in here. Um, I don't have money for a pork chop turn for you, but um, one free or very low cost thing is a, a word from one of your slides, and that's collaboration. We found for YOLO Healthy Aging Alliance, when we started back in 2010, was during the Great Recession, and we were really worried that there weren't programs for older adults, and so when we started bringing in the diff all the different providers for older adult services, we started with 10. I I now in Yolo County, I now have 90 different organizations, diff not people, organizations that provide services for older adults. So there are th there are nonprofits and for profits out there for services and for for different for getting things done in the community if people know about them. So I think that the collaborative model is really a low cost, no cost way of of. Um, not solving, but bringing um, some, some more services and um, enhancing life, so collaboration. Okay, we're gonna take two more questions. We got one back there and we got one over there. And then we're a small enough group that I think people can just kind of hang out and chat. So um, we'll take a question there and a question there. Hi, my name is Leslie Krenna. I'm um, speaking as a member of Waterwise Davis. Um, I'm curious, Dr. Baca, um, about um, to what degree water resources are considered in the general plan guidelines document. Um, what I'm seeing um, across California is that there are some um, municipalities that are incredibly forward thinking, like San Francisco has district level gray water systems for high rises. And then I'm seeing other practices like LID, um, low impact development, um, which you know impacts um, landscapes and infiltration of water and, and you know, connects to all sorts of health um, issues um, where the overflows are still at the, the bottom of the infiltration instead of at the top. So I know that's, you know, a, a landscape issue, but I'm curious how water is being addressed, how aggressively it's being addressed. 
Yeah, so one of the things is, um, so I, meant, I mentioned it was years to do the plan. So when we started off, we were still in the drought. <laughs> then we went to the other side where we were flooding. Um, so um, one is that within this update, um, we heard a lot of water concerns and, and issues. There are going to, for the next, so there are a couple of next pieces. So like I'm doing outreach right now on SB 1000, which got integrated, but not as, as robustly as we wanted just because it got passed. And water is one of the other issues where there's going to be, um, upcoming guidance on that. So that was be one to stay tuned. In terms of like specifically around health, I think the issue is that um, that is a great example on, you know, waste, you know, water recapture, not having paved areas. So those are things where, I, again, I think just even noticing that there's the health link helps with projects when they're doing this to bring that voice in and say, actually, this helps because it makes it a much more um, inviting landscape that you're going to want to be walking in, right? That's actually good for recapture and other, all of those other benefits. So um, I would say stay tuned on the water piece. Over in the corner. And that'll be our last question, and then we'll welcome you to stay and chat. It's a really pretty cool piece. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martha, and I was thinking about, it's been mentioned about um, food in the schools, and I thought about where all the rest of the meals are being eaten, which is in the home and um, ways to address um, healthy food being eaten in the home. Uh, we've gone from a long time ago of having very healthy, basically organic, because pesticides weren't around yet, to now pesticides, GMO, um, et cetera, all the processed foods that are there. Um, I think that's a very hard issue to address. Um, who prepares the meals in the home? Um, do the people have time, or do they just want to have convenience, fast food, and um, thinking how that could be addressed? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think that gets really down to the individual level. So this kind of work is really thinking, again, more about the systems and policies in place. I think just kind of thinking back to when I was in clinical practice, a lot of it has to do with, you know, is someone, is someone working two jobs? That came up already, right? So if someone's working a lot and they need to, you know, get everything ready for the next day, it's much harder to kind of sit down and cook a healthy meal, right? Um, the other piece is, is it even available? So is it affordable? So I think that's, you know, kind of thinking more on the system side of, you know, is it, the, is it just the farmer's market or is there something else that's available? What are the, the services that are, are there? The other thing I would say, and this is kind of, again, more at the community levels, you think about food policy councils and things like that, is just education. So a lot of people, you know, are not as, as not as educated in even cooking anymore because people have gotten really used to eating out more. And so you, people say, of course, people know how to cook. That's actually not the case. And, and so I think just kind of education and pro, again, programs, systems and things to support families to do that. That, um, are part of the solution, but I don't know if you thought since you used yeah. to do on the school. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that was, um, well, uh, I think that the education. There was some discussion about education over here too. So it's really starting with that that approach to meals and eating from a young age. I'm not to say that m my generation is throwaway because I w I started out with you know having. Um, more organic kind of things and then convenience came along and now I think that overall we are moving back towards that so if we can really work in the schools and with the parents on on education and really the availability of uh, affordable good food how it goes a long way in the communities so that they have access to it well I want to I want to thank everybody Elizabeth and uh, our panelists, our local panelists as well for coming. I, I will say that on the issue of health, um, my sense is that a city of our size, people don't naturally look to the city, local government, as uh, really having any role in local health. We probably look at the next level of the county and say, well, the county's got all the social services. Um, I think what this talk uh, and conversation leads us to understand is that Many of us are involved in, in practices that either improve, contribute to, or, or not. And therefore, you know, um, broader community health is happening. It's the purview of our organizations. Whether we frame it that way or not, it, you know, getting people on bikes and walking, um, providing active transportation alternatives, um, uh, even, as I said, dealing with conflict. These are, these are health-enhancing uh, activities we can do. My hope would be that we would, in our, in our general plan update, 
not be afraid to talk explicitly about a health element and by saying, well, you know, wait a second, we're a, we're a small city. We don't have a health program. We don't have a health department. We don't have, you know, we don't have a social services plan. Uh, and that we'll embrace it from the perspective of all the things we do, whether they are arguably contributing to health and healthy lifestyles or not. And I think that's one of the big take takeaway messages here is that we can talk about it. We should talk about it because many of the things that go into our normal general plan do impact the health of the community members. So, Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming, and uh, we appreciate it. And you'll stick around, right, for a little bit. She's got about she, she's got about till she's got a couple minutes. Uh, come grab her quickly and stick around, and um, look forward to the next one of these. Thank you very much.